If you enjoy watching Common Ground online, please consider making a tax-deductible donation at lptv.org. Lakeland Public Television presents Common Ground, brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Welcome to Common Ground. I'm your host, Scott Knudsen. In this two-segment episode, visit the Pine Tree Patchworkers Quilt Show in Brainerd. Then come along with Monty Draper as he plants three quarters of a million trees. My name is Carol Lang and I'm going to take you on a tour today of the Pine Tree Patchworkers Quilt Show and it's called Home Sweet Quilted Home. First we have our vendors and some of them are local and many of them are from other places throughout the state of Minnesota. This is our members boutique and the members would take things that they have from their stash that either they no longer want or something that they want to sell. So they bring all these things and of course there are other shoppers who want to look at somebody else's stash and buy from there also. The quilts are categorized in themes. So we have some brights in some of these areas, some bright colors and bright new designs. This might be something that you would see that is something that is rather new. It's a new style, it's new fabrics. And this is a, a piece done by Kathy Bardolph, one of our members. And um, she's used a lot of modern fabrics and some really bright and new things. So, okay, as we move along, you can again see themed with some of the modern quilts and colors. And then over here we have a lot of the bed quilts, you know, the, the bed size, king size quilts. And on the back row here, these are called challenge quilts, all these small ones along here. And the challenge quilt, when we, we do a, a quilt show, we give it a name. Like this time it's Home Sweet Quilted Home. So each member was challenged to make an 18 by 18 wall hanging, something to do to represent home. And along with it, they had to have the, these little words here. We had a sheet of words and each participant had to use this element somewhere in their quilt. This quilt is called Messy Houses by Brenda Peterson and she thought this represented her home because she said I'm a quilter and I'm um, I do I love to quilt and I love to do these things and my house is always messy and so that's the pattern name and then she incorporated the different things the different words in her squares with messy houses. Okay again you see some of the large size quilts here the bed quilts and in in this stall here we've got a lot more of the art quilts. This one and this one are both art quilts that were done by one of our chairpersons, Jan Sheets. You can see it looks like a painting. You know, when you stand from afar, it, you, you can't believe this is all done out of fabric. And so she's got a good eye for all, these, all the different colors. So we have a guild meeting once a month and we meet at Lord of Life Lutheran Church on the second Monday of every month at 6.45. And we have such a variety of quilters at a, in our guild. We have very beginners and we, you know, we have some of the masters of quilting in our group. And you know, we have a business meeting, but we also uh, make time during every meeting to have show and tell. And it's kind of everybody's favorite time where, where you show what you've done. We love every level of quilting and we love to see how members progress. Over here, let me show you this one. This is Karen Martin, um, who is one of our members has done Beautiful, beautiful applique work, and you can see all the detail. All of this is turned under and stitched, so you cannot see the stitches. It's incredible. I'm Carla Overland. I'm from Cherrywood Fabrics. We are a hand-dyed fabric business in Brainerd, Minnesota. This is the first challenge that we've done. It's um, it's sent out 
open up to any quilter or artist who's interested and we give them a set of guidelines. And our guidelines were, our theme was Wicked. Our colors were taken from the Wicked logo, so we, I dyed up three special greens that, and a black. So everybody started out with the same color fabrics. And they had to be 20 inches square. And they could add other colors to it as long as it was cherry wood hand dyed fabric. So these quilts are all cherry wood. And then on top of that, they could just do whatever they wanted. So we've got different techniques. There's painting and beading and hand stitching and machine quilting, and they could do whatever they wanted. Quilting is just another art form. Instead of using paint, you're using fabric. We got 114 entries, which was amazing. We were, since this is the first time we've done it, we're expecting hopefully like 25, so getting 114 was awesome. The really cool thing about this, it's been seen by so many non-quilters in the public places, and people just are amazed that these are made out of fabric. So it's opened up the, a whole new audience, and people can really appreciate it as art form. These are the top three winners. We did have a group of five judges choose their favorites, which was very hard to do and they came up with the first place winner. She's actually from Fargo, North Dakota, and she won $650 worth of fabric, and second place winner got $200, and third place got $100. So all of these quilts traveled, 114 quilts, and they are um, just amazing, the amount of work, the detail. Like, for instance, this one is wire that's actually curled up and sewn onto the fabric. There's beading, there's very, very small, tiny piecing. This isn't all black. There's many shades of blues and blacks and, and purples. There's embellishment with jewelry and ribbon. This is one of my favorites, and it actually won viewers' choice. Every quilt show that we bring this to, we have the audience pick their favorite, and this is the one that won viewers' choice at the last quilt show. And I love her perspective, like you're looking down into the tornado. What inspired me to do this was I saw Wicked on Broadway and the costuming is just amazing and the sets were amazing and I'm a graphic designer so the logo immediately spoke to me and I love the graphic nature of it. So that's what started this whole thing. These quilts here are actually representations of the quilts. They're flat, I actually had them printed on fabric because the original quilts are still traveling with the, uh, the Wicked traveling tour. So right now it's in Denver, Colorado, and I'm not sure where it's gonna go next, but they chose nine quilts to keep traveling. Because this was so successful, we were asked immediately, are you gonna have a book? I'd love to have pictures of all these quilts. So we did publish a book, and all 114 quilts are in here. And I give each quilt a page with artist statements and a detail shot because I know that I like to look at these over and over, so it's really nice to have something to refer to, especially if you're a quilter and you have a creative block and you can just page through this and just be totally inspired. This area is represents all of the community service work that our club does, starting with the crisis quilts. We donate about 200 quilts just to the crisis area in a year. And club members make the quilts and we donate them to social services in Crowing County and other area counties that need quilts for people that are in need. People that um, have experienced some sort of a crisis like a fire or a child being removed from the home or um, some type to port for, for teenagers that that are living away from home for various reasons. Every habitat house that is built in our area give the gift of a quilt, a bed quilt, and when they have their open house, when the, when the people move into the, their Habitat for Humanity house, we present them with the quilt. And this one is going out to a, a family in this area in the middle of July, so that's our next one. Quilts of Valor is an organization that makes quilts for servicemen who have been wounded in the war. And unfortunately, we have been making quilts of valor for way too many years. And, um, but we still have a very dedicated group of women that are making quilts. And they, they have a kind of a standard size. So if you look at this one behind me here, the red, white, and blue, this is a very good example of one that would be presented to a wounded serviceman. And 
sometimes we hear from them. Sometimes, you know, if a, if a quilter puts her label on it, we hear back from these service people and they're always so very, very thankful or their families are very, very thankful for the gift they've received. Then on the table here we have our placemats and these are given to our Meals on Wheels recipients and they they love their their treats that they get at Christmas time. Now, wouldn't you just love to eat your lunch on a placemat that has cupcakes on it or um, as you're looking out the window eating your lunch and having the placemat with the this cutest bird ever. So those are really fun and we enjoy giving those away. And usually we give about 90 to 100 placemats each Christmas. And then we also do the Christmas stockings. And the Christmas stockings go to kids who are at port and it also goes to different organizations that we would maybe send our crisis quilts to, you know, to social services that families in need. And then we try and find little gifts that go inside too. So we collect uh, lotions and um, little games and, and fun things to stuff the stockings with also. These are jail quilts. We have one group of people that sew quilts with the women at the Crow Wing County Jail and they've been doing that for several years. And it's a great boost for some of the women who maybe feel at their, they're at their bottom of their emotional being and somebody comes in and takes time to sew with them. And some have maybe never sewed and now all of a sudden they can, they've got this done and this might go home to one of their families, uh, go to one of their children. So it gives them a really boost that they can accomplish something when they're really at their low. So this whole bay is quilts that were done in classes. You know, if you sign up for a class and you work in like maybe these quilts, it took over a year to make and they do maybe a block of, you know, it's called block of the month mm -hmm. or a section at a time. Mm -hmm. And then they, they come back and they meet and they show what they've done and then they get instructions for the next section that they're going to be doing and, and then come back, go home, do it and then they come back and show what they've done and until the quilt is done. So it's kind of a fun way of learning and accomplishing something. People that don't quilt and you talk about quilting, sometimes they think you're kind of crazy because they see how much fabric you own and they see how much time you spend on it. Um, so that when you're with the people that in your, in your group, your quilting group, it's a great feeling of camaraderie. It's a really good bonding time. This is a private sale and this is considered a wild plant. In other words, the site isn't prepped uh, for uh, planting trees. But as you can see, this guy is a great steward of the forest and he's really cleaned up his woods really nice. And uh, for the two days, I'll put in uh, 2,400 trees for him. And these are uh, uh, all containerized trees. As you can see, they're uh, contained in their own earth system. These will grow right after they're put in the ground. Some people will buy the bare roots, and as you can see the difference between the two, the bare roots are bigger. The downside to the, these guys is the root system, you gotta really be careful that they're all in the ground when you plant them. And the bare, trip, bare roots have a, like a three year cycle. The first year they seep, creep, and then grow. So for three years they're kind of not doing much. Where these, you plant them right away and they go, but they are smaller. Oh, this is uh, grown in uh, styrofoam cubes. So there's 200, uh, 250 in a cube, and these are grown right straight in the uh, outside earth system, uh, outside in a farm. These are grown in Bedora. These are grown actually in Canada. And these are nice to plant. You don't have to worry about the root system at all. And so uh, these are very fast and very easy to plant. I really like these trees versus the bare roots. Better success. Then you don't have to worry about jay rooting because if one of these roots sits outside the hole as you plant it, it'll dry it out and kill the tree. And this is the main root that you really got to protect here, that, this one right here. So yeah, you got to know all this stuff. And as you can see, I use a sharpshooter shovel when I plant. This is my medium weight shovel. I have two shovels. I have the lightweight here because I'm in sand. And then this is my medium weight shovel. And it's just a number 14 spade. But then I hire a welder to weld this metal plate on the back. 
and then to strengthen it, we weld it here, or I asked them to weld it. First one that I uh, had this friend make for me, it snapped right here. And so then after that, we decided, well, we need to make it stronger, more durable. And it adds weight to the shovel, but there's no flex or bend to the shovel when you plant it. So when you hit the ground and move it, the earth moves, not the shovel. There's no flex. I grind these down quite often, and these I've just wired brushed down each night. So far this year, I've only had one bad plant site, which was a lot of rocks, and I literally had to take the bends out of it, each plant. So it was kind of getting depressing and taking a long time to, but, but that was in the Lake of the Woods. And here comes our own one. Well, this is what Monty planted three years ago. And the progression, the growth is just remarkable. When the storm came in here, it came in straight, micro bursts, so you had these down drafts that came in and it would take out an area like this and lay everything down. But look at how this has come in now. These are all seedlings in, Monty planted. The seed that are on the ground that was under that canopy are all laying there dormant. So these seeds are now gonna start sprouting and you're gonna get natural regeneration occurring along with our plantings. When you do it manually instead of by machine, you can place your trees where you want them and not wind roam. So when this comes up, it's gonna look natural. And as tree plantations, when they put them in machines, it looks so mechanical and there's rows. And we want it to look as natural as possible. So, you know, 40 years from now, it's gonna look like Mother Nature put in this stand of trees as opposed to just like a cornfield. So the stewardship of putting your trees back is really important and, and that's a progression that regardless of a storm you're still always planting putting in varieties and replenishing what has been lost just through natural mortality a lot of this would have regenerated itself but he's really customizing it really nice so he's really got a nice diverse let's see with the shrubs here at this landing here for the grouse and uh, when you're out here working you really get in tune what's around you. You really can hear stuff that you may not normally notice. And out here, as you heard earlier, all the geese coming into the lake. Well, as you can see, I switched to left hand now. And when I learned to tree plant, I found out that uh, early on that uh, you grab your shovel by the shaft here and slam it. Because if you grabbed it by the handle like this and slam it, you get all that pressure here on the top of your forearms and you get terrible tendonitis. Where here, you now your arm is turned and you don't get that slam slam. And uh, boy, I tell you one thing, you get tendonitis just once and you'll, you'll learn to grab her down by here. My back has been kind to me and I've been able to actually last 30 years. And the trick with the trees is to get them at the right depth. And this is where they came out of the soil, so that should be how deep you should go, is right here. So every tree I grab, I grab at the height that I want to hit the ground. Yeah, so this is a, a year that I've really planted a wide variety of species for private people. So far, I've dropped, what, 7,400 I counted this morning. I planted in the last week. And I have one more contract, which I'll fill tomorrow and be done. I was looking at my counts and uh, that will be the least amount of trees I've ever planted. Even the very first year I started, and I started, we started as a team, we worked in the forest as a team, and you had your own individual boxes. The first year I learned to plant, I did 8,000. And so this year I'll hit about 78, 77, 7,700. So this will be the least. So my first year eight now, hopefully my last year. There's no, I wasn't gonna plant this year, but there's so many uh, private individuals that bought a lot of trees and contacted me and said, uh, please help us out. And so, yeah, I did that for him, so. Monty, how many trees do you estimate that you've planted in your <laughs> career? Well. I knew you'd ask me that, and so I looked on my calendar, and so far, not counting this year, I have 740,000 trees. Yeah, 740,000, so that's, that's a few trees. And that's uh, private and county. 
the majority of course is county. And I've done more bud capping on trees than I've planted. Because <laughs> I'll do about 100 acres, so you're talking maybe a 80 to 100,000 trees a, a fall of bud capping. Where you take a little piece of paper and staple it over the top of the tree. So yeah, I've got my numbers up there. A lot of touching of trees. And, uh, and this technique is called sweeping the heel. So if you got a lot of stuff in your way, if I was just to slam my shovel in there, sticks and uh, um, the soil will get in your eyes. And I tell you, I've, I've had a dry seasons where I've had to wear safety glasses and they steam up. Yeah, you can see how these white pines have just been nailed by the deer. See the bud? There's no bud on it. It's just totally been eaten down. So then we put these nets up and hopefully that will protect it. Yeah, until it gets a certain height. But I'm doing all red pine here today for bud. And then he has me come back in the fall and bud cap to protect them. So. Yesterday morning we we're, we we're listening to sandhill cranes. And this morning it's Canadian geese. And what we have is a site here with jack pines. And this is the third time they've bud capped this site. Just because I've seen trees out here that have uh, three, three pieces of paper on it. And uh, when you bud cap tree, you pick the dominant bud. And then you, uh, your bottom, bottom staple is tight to the stem of the tree. Outside, up high. And that way you put up high one and if the deer take the first bite, they'll get a staple in the mouth. So that's a good thing. And this one is a tree that's played out. You can see that this section's dead. And this one I'll take over. So that's how she works. Bud capping keeps the deer, and they're, they're a smart animal. The first year they'll keep them away from grabbing it and eating it. And, uh, and then after a while, they kind of get acclimated to it, get used to it, and then they'll come in and pull on it. If there's a lot of deer, what I'll do is I'll bud cap, and then they'll have the plant skid, the bud sprayers, come in and spray the paper. And that works like a charm. The deer can't figure that one out yet. The plant skid is pig's blood and vegetable fat mixed together. They mix uh, vegetable fat with it because it holds the blood. It coagulates it and holds the blood onto the product, whatever you spray it on. They came out with plant skid and hoping that they could just spray it and leave it, but it does wear off. But when it's on the paper, it gives that paper a death smell forever. So the deer don't like it. But you can see out here the success of these trees. These are really, I mean, the success out here is awesome. So it's obviously that the deer haven't been eating them. There's, there's a few that I find along the edges over in here that uh, the top bud, the dominant bud is gone. And so the deer have started browsing. These are between three to four feet apart. Even some of them are tighter than that. So that's why this site has a lot, a lot of trees. And as you saw my map, it's pretty easy to see where I've been. It's like a flag everywhere. And sometimes with jacks, they'll have multiple, multiple tops, so it's hard to determine which one to staple and protect. So then, what I do is I look for the biggest bud on the tree, and the forest growers will hire us to uh, bud cap, um, Norway's jacks and especially white pines. Deer love white pines. It's like cotton candy. You learn a lot about trees and their willingness and wanting to live. You know, you find a tree that dies here and a section off takes over and kind of get in tune with every sound in the woods. And uh, this one's been nipped by deer. This is the reason why we bud cap because as you can see, this tree has a nice diameter to it but yet the deer has nipped it several times and uh, taken off the dominant buds and a couple of its smaller ones. And so uh, this one is a typical of why I'm out here doing it. When you bud cap this, this section, it's hard to find really one that bud cap. And so 
I'll do that and hopefully the deer will leave it alone. Yeah, it's nice to see so a few trees being browsed on. That's really nice. And uh, as you can see, as you came in, you saw a lot of a lot of trees already done. So probably tomorrow I'll have done 60,000 out on the site already. You know, you think about this for me, I've nine years capping, eight years, 11, that's not quite 30, but you get to know it pretty good. Thanks so much for watching. Join us again next time on Common Ground. If you have an idea for a Common Ground piece that pertains to North Central Minnesota, email us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3014. To view any episode of Common Ground online, visit us at lptv.org. episodes or segments of Common Ground, call 218-333-3020. Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People, November 4th, 2008. If you enjoyed this episode of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.